The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So you've been learning about uh, statistical mechanics, the microscopic underpinnings of thermodynamics. And uh, last time, you, uh, we ended up um, working with the canonical partition function and showing that once you have the canonical partition function, you have basically every thermodynamic quantity that you've learned how to calculate uh, this far in the course. Um, but before I uh, start, on the lecture notes 25, there were a couple typos in there that actually didn't make any difference to the final result because they canceled each other out. But it's been corrected on the web uh, version. And then near the bottom of the page, because uh, we're going to be mostly using these notes today, near the bottom of the page where it says A is equal to U minus TS is equal to U, that should be a plus here. D A D T volume. And then further down the next line, blah 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 blah, minus u over t squared, and this should be a minus here. One over t d a d t v and etc. So luckily these two typos canceled each other and the result was correct, but there it is. Okay. So um, last time, then, you saw how, from the canonical partition function, you could get something like the energy. And you wrote down an equation. The energy is equal to kt squared d log q dt under constant volume and number of particles. And then you notice that. Um, the important variables are the volume, the number of particles, and the temperature. And we know that every thermodynamic quantity has a set of, uh, of um, natural variables. For the Gibbs free energy, it was the pressure and the temperature, the number of particles. And for the volume of the number of uh, particles and the temperature, we know that that's the uh, Helmholtz free energy. Right. So the natural variable that we would associate, the natural thermodynamic variable we would associate with that set of constraints is the Helmholtz free energy. So it becomes interesting then to figure out how can we write the Helmholtz free energy in terms of the canonical partition function. They seem to have the same set of natural variables. And that's what you started doing and what we'll do today. And that's where the typo comes in. So let's uh, write what we know about the, uh, can, uh, about the Helmholtz free energy in terms of the, um, of, the, of, the, of the energy U. I already wrote it up there, U minus TS. That's the definition of the Helmholtz free energy. And from the fact that dA is equal to minus PdV uh, minus SdT plus mu dN, uh, we can read out what S here is in terms of the Helmholtz free energy. S is just dA dt constant V and N, right? So we can plug that in here. U is minus T dA with a uh, minus sign there. So that becomes the plus, and hence the typo, dT constant V and N. OK, so now we have an equation that relates u and the partition function. We want an equation that relates a and the partition function. If we rearrange this slightly, we can get that u then is equal to um, a minus t dA dt constant v and n. So the question that we could ask ourselves is, 
is there a function of A that kind of looks like that? And I know the answer, so I'm going to give it to you. Okay. A function of A that looks like the sum of A minus something times the derivative with respect to that something, uh, we should try to look at something like the, the, the derivative dA dt dt, constant v and n. So if you take that derivative, you end up with 1 over t dA dt. minus a over t squared, period. But if you, take, if you look at this uh, uh, result here and you multiply by t squared, there's the a and there's the t times dA dt. There's the a that we just have the sign wrong, right? So we have mul multiply this by minus t squared, minus t squared times minus t squared, and you have the same the same thing is here. So that tells us then that u is, can be written as minus t squared dA over t dt constant volume. It's a nice way to relate those two uh, energies. And we have an expression for you in terms of the canonical function. Uh, uh, and we can then replace it in here. And that gets us then uh, that uh, minus t squared dA over t dt, constant number and volume, is equal to u. And u, we saw, was equal to kt squared d log q dt, k t squared d log q dt, again, and fixed. And then we can start um, getting rid of things. Now the t squareds disappear here. And then we have d dt on this side and k dt. Let's just take the integral. Right? Take the integral of both sides. And that gets us that then that uh, a over t is equal to k log q plus a constant of integration. And we can take that constant of integration to be whatever we want. Energies are relative to some reference point. We can take it to be 0. a is equal to k t log q. That's a pretty neat result. There's the microscopic underpinning of things where we know about atoms and energies and states and even quantum mechanics and all sorts of things goes into here. All the microscopic information goes in here. And there's a thermodynamic variable that only cares about the macroscopic state of matter. It doesn't care that there are atoms there. It just cares that you know the pressure, the volume, the temperature, or any couple variables, and you can get a direct equality without any derivatives or anything between the macroscopic and the microscopic. So this is, this is really pretty remarkable. And once you have A, you have everything. Just like before, we said once you have G, the Gibbs free energy, when we were talking about things that depended on pressure and temperature, you have everything. It's the same thing here. We've got A, we've got U. We have everything. We can calculate every single thermodynamic variable from then on. For instance, if we want to have the entropy, S is equal to minus a over t minus u over t. Where did I get that? I got that from way up here. a is equal to u minus t s. I solve for s in terms of a and u. I've got expressions in terms of the canonical function for a and u. Plug that in there. Get k log q plus kt uh, d log q dt, constant number and volume. Etc. You can get the pressure. You can get the pressure from the fact that the uh, uh, the pressure up here is a derivative of a with respect to volume. So you take the derivative of a with respect to volume here. You get the pressure. If you want the chemical potential, the chemical potential from the 
a fundamental equation up here is the derivative of a with respect to the number of particles. You take the derivative of a with respect to the number of particles. You get the chemical potential in terms of the canonical function, uh, par partition function. So you've got everything. You've got u, you've got a, you've got p, you've got s, you've got h, you've got g. Name your variable. You've got it. The, uh, can, the, uh, you want the heat capacity. I can get you the heat capacity in terms of the, grant of the partition function. OK, any questions? All right, so um, let's go on. Let's look a little bit closer at the entropy in terms of, of these microscopic uh, 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 theory here. So let's start with S is A minus U over T, and let's see how far we can go. Okay. All right. Let's write it in terms of, let's write A and U in terms of, the, uh, of, of, of things that we know. And, and let, me, let me just go to the end to tell you where I'm going and why I'm going to make certain changes in my, in my math here. So what we're going to get at the end is that S is this very nice quantity, which is minus K PI log PI, where the P's are the microstate probabilities. Okay? The probability that your state is in a particular, yes? Uh, is S, A minus U or U minus A? S is U, uh, S is U minus A, yes. U minus A, thank you. I should read my notes. Okay, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, equate S here in terms of the probabilities of microstates. And that's going to be, the, remember how we talked about S is related to um, concepts of randomness or order or disorder. And so the number of possible microstates is related to the number of amount of disorder that you might have. If you have a pure crystal and every atom is in its place, then the number of microstates at zero degrees Kelvin is one. Right? So the probability of being in that microstate is one, and the probability of being in every other microstate is zero. All right, so there's, there's a relationship that, that we're going to have here, which is going to be interesting. Let's, let's drive it. That means that we're going to want to have this somehow pop out of the equation. Right? We're going to want to have this pop out of the equation. If you remember, uh, PI is the um, uh, PI is the e to the minus EI over KT divided by the partition function Q, right? So somehow we're going to have to get this to come out. We're going to have to have these e to the minus EI over KTs come out. Okay, so let's, let's try to get them to come out right away. Uh, we know U, a way to write U is the average energy, which means uh, uh, let's take uh, 1 over kT out here, and there's a, let's divide by k here, let's get the k here, kT here. We're going to want to have a k come out here, there's the k here, so that's one way of getting it to come out. And uh, then the U is going to be the average energy, e to the minus EI over kT, okay, that's just writing the average energy, the, um, so the energy times the probability of having that energy divided by the uh, normalization plus, well, A is just log Q. A over KT is just log Q. Okay. So we've managed to extract this guy out here. Okay. Now, um, this sum here, there's, this is sum over I. I'd really like to have this sum come all the way out. Right? So I've got to find a way to do that. And it would be nice if, um, if I could find a sum here. Uh, I've got to, maybe if I multiply by 1, but write 1 in a funny way. OK. Get a log here. You know, if I've got a couple logs here, maybe I can combine them to get a ratio. So uh, let's rewrite this EI in a, in a funny way here. EI 
is, I'm just rewriting it, but in a strange way, log e to the minus ei over kt. Right? So if I take the log of e to the minus ei over kt, I get minus ei over kt. The kts disappear, so I just get ei is equal to ei. I'm just writing something that's um, pretty obvious here. All right, and then we're going to take that expression, put it in here. So now I'm going to be able to write s over k is minus. Uh, so the kt here cancels out this kt here. Sum over i, e to the minus ei over kt over q. That's that term right here. And then I have the ei, which is log of e to the minus ei over kt. This whole thing is in this parenthesis here. And then I have the plus log q. Plus log q. OK. OK. So I have this nice thing here, e to the minus ei over kt divided by q. Well, that's looking an awful lot like this, uh, this pi here, right? which is what I'm trying to get out. Right? I'm trying to get these pi's coming out. So that's a, that's a nice thing to have here. Now, if I could only have a pi coming out here somehow, that would be great too. And if I also could get a sum here, that's a sum over i, I could sort of combine everything together. So I'm going to write 1 in a funny way. 1 is equal to the sum of all probabilities. Right? That's obvious. And I'm going to write this pi here in a form that looks like this. Sum over all i e to the minus ei over kt divided by q. Just writing 1. Right? Sum of all probabilities equal to 1. And I'm going to take this 1 here, and I'm going to put it right in here. Now, log q doesn't care on i, so it's just a number. So that allows me to rewrite s over k is minus the sum over i e to the minus ei over kt divided by the partition function times the log of e to the minus ei over kt plus sum over i e to the, e to the minus ei over kt over q times log q. OK, good. I'm going to take these, these summations. Now everything is over the sum over ei. This is great. And there's this factor here, e to the minus ei over kt divided by the partition function. That appears in both. I can factor that out. And then I have these two logs, log of this and log of that, that I can also combine together. This is the log of this, and then there's, going to, there's a minus sign, so uh, they're going to, if I take the, it's going to be the log of this minus the log of that, it's going to end up with a ratio. Okay? S over K is equal to minus EI, taking the summation out, E to the minus EI over KT over Q. That's this term and that term. And then I have the logs. Log of e to the minus ei over kt. This is a minus sign. This is a plus sign. That means I divide here by q. OK, this is great. Look, there's e to the minus ei over kt over q, e to the minus ei over kt over q. What is that? That's just pi. is pi. That's the probability of microstate i. And this is equal to minus sum over i pi log pi. There's the k here. s is equal to minus k log sum over i pi log pi. 
Another great result. Now, if your system is isolated, if you have an isolated system, that means that the energy, you've got your boundary, right? The boundary is, doesn't let energy go in and out, doesn't let the number of particles go in and out. Every single microstate is going to have the same energy if the system is isolated. The only thing you're going to change is the positions of the particles or their vibrational energy or something. But, well, let's just stick with translation. You're just going to change the positions. You're not going to change the energy. Okay. So if the system is isolated, then uh, the degeneracy of your energy is just a number of ways that you can flip the positions around in distinguishable ways. So the probability is just one over the number of possible ways of switching positions around for your particles. Right? So for an isolated system, microstates have the same energy, we can set that equal to zero as a reference point. And the probability of being any, in any one microstate is just one over the number of possible ways of rearranging things. Right? So the net probability of being any, in any one microstate is one over the number of microstates. They all have the same energy. Where this is the degeneracy. So now when you plug that in here, S is minus K, uh, sum over all microstates from I equals zero to uh, one over blah, log of blah. This is a number. It can come out. The sum of one to um, omega of one over omega is omega times omega. It's one. The one over omega, the log of one over omega is minus the log of omega. The negative signs cancel out. K log capital omega. For an isolated system, you've seen this before, probably. This is what's on. Uh, this is called the Boltzmann equation, and that is what on his, is on his tombstone. If you go to, I think it's in Germany somewhere. Is it in Germany? You guys know? Austria. Austria thank you. I knew it was that part of the world. And you go to Austria to some famous cemetery and go look for the tombstone that says S is equal to log omega. That's where Boltzmann's buried. Okay, now so this picture of, and yes, question. Argument for making that one over omega go away. For making the one over omega go away here? Because uh, you're taking the sum of all states from one, I equals one to omega. So it's one over omega plus one over omega plus one over omega plus omega times. And this is just a number, so it comes out. It's not in the sum. So the sum here is all by itself. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, that's why we that's why we talk about entropy as being this this um, this uh, fundamental property that tells you about uh, the number of available states. That's what it is. You've got this connection now between this this variable, which is sort of hard to really intuitively understand when you're talking about thermodynamics, and this is much easier to understand here in terms of the available ways of distributing your um, your energy or your particles in this case here 
uh, in different, different bins. Okay, any questions? Good. So the next, uh, the next topic is we're going to, um, we're going to work a little bit with the partition functions and see how when you have systems that have multiple degrees of freedom, where each degree of freedom has a different kind of energy, let's say translation, rotation, vibration, then you can have a partition function for each of these degrees of freedom. And whereas the energies of the degrees of freedom add up, the partition functions get multiplied. So it's the separation of the partition functions into uh, uh, subsystem partition functions. Right? So, so far, um, we've, uh, we've written for a translational partition function that the uh, system uh, partition function is the molecular partition function to the nth power if you have distinguishable particles and you have to divide by 1 over n factorial, or divide by n factorial, if you can swap particles without knowing the difference. This is the number of ways of swapping n particles uh, with each other. So if it's indistinguishable particles. Okay, so now let's say that um, uh, let's just make sure that um, let, let's say that your your energy of your system. Yes. Um, just from right before we got into this. Yes. It says that even if the system is not isolated, energy of substitution is inequitable for a multiple molecule. Where does that approximation break down? So um, where does it say that? In, in the notes. Uh, let me see the notes here. Where does it say that? It's not these notes. Uh, so that that sentence has to do with this this guy here, right? Basically, it says that uh, if you've got a, a huge number of particles, the average energy is a given number, and the fluctuations around that average are very small. And so um, uh, you, the, the system behaves as if it's isolated. That the, uh, so when you have a system which is not isolated, uh, then energy can come in and out of the system. So in principle, over time, you could have huge energy fluctuations as energy comes out or energy comes in. Uh, and if you have a, a, a countable number of um, molecules in your system, um, then if one molecule suddenly captures a lot of energy, then the whole system energy will go up a lot. Right? But if you have 10 to the 24th molecules, if one molecule suddenly gains a lot of energy, the system energy doesn't care. Right, so small fluctuations or big fluctuations in the small number of molecules doesn't make any difference to the total energy. And so you can still use, you can still use this then. It is good enough. So how long is that good enough? Like how big is the system um, Well, if it's, if, it's, if it's accountable, if you have a handful of things, then it's not valid. And if it's 10 to the 24th, then it's valid. And somewhere in between, it breaks down. And I don't know what the answer is to that. But usually, if you have a thermodynamic system, then it's big enough. Right? That's what thermodynamics is about, where you don't really care that you have atoms there. You don't even know you have atoms there. So it's big enough. OK, good question. All right, so now let's, uh, let's take our microstate energy here. And it's the, our microstate energy is a sum of all the molecular energies EI, right? So um, it's a sum of all energies E, e sub um, 
uh, over all, all, the, uh, all the atoms. And, and each one of these energies, um, if it's a molecular energies, could be um, indexed by a quantum number of some sort. Right? So it would be the sum over all energies. Uh, so quantum number for, for particle one, and one is some sort of quantum number, and two is some sort of quantum number, and three is some sort of quantum number. And then you have all the uh, mole molecules, E and one plus E and two plus E and three, plus et cetera. So this is the, the energy for molecule one, energy for molecule two, energy for molecule three, energy for molecule four. And that little n tells you which energy state that molecule is. And the sum of all these energies is your microstate energy. As long as you can write this this way, then you're allowed to write it this way. So that basically, that means that they're not interacting with each other. They're independent from each other in this case here. So now if I write uh, Q in terms of the sum over all microstates, EI, e to the minus ei over kt. I'm going to replace this ei here with the sum over all these energies here. And so the sum over all microstates then becomes the sum over all possible combinations of quantum numbers, n1, n2, n3, n4, et cetera. Okay. All the possible ways of getting uh, molecule one in some state, all the possible ways of getting molecule two in some quantum number state. And then uh, E to the minus, and instead of capital E I, I'm going to write the molecular energies. E N one plus E N two plus E epsilon N three plus et cetera, and then divide by KT. Okay. Basically, I'm going to prove, prove that this is this is a fine statement to make as long as you can write the energy as a sum of uh, component energies. OK, so now this term here, e to the minus en1, only cares about this sum here. en2, that's molecule number two, only cares about this sum here. Molecule number three only cares about the sum over all possible quantum numbers connected to molecule number three. So I can factor out all these sums uh, into, uh, into a factor of sums, which is equal to the sum over uh, quantum number n1, e to the minus epsilon of n1 divided by kt times n2, e to the minus epsilon n2 over kt times n3 e to the minus epsilon n3 over kt, et cetera. Okay. And now each one of these is basically the molecular partition function. These are all the possible energies of that molecule. Right? And the sum over all possible energies times e to the minus e over kt is the partition function for the molecule. So we have q for molecule one times q for molecule two. And they're all the same. They're n of them. So it's q to the n. So I've just, in a way, clarified that the reason why we're able to write this system partition function in terms of the molecular partition functions with n of them to the nth power is because we were able to separate out the energy here in terms of independent molecular energies, where basically this is saying the molecules don't interact with each other. They're independent from each other. And then the 1 over n factorial comes in so that you don't overcount for a translation uh, the positions if they're, if they're uh, indistinguishable. OK, so now we can have, actually, we're not, uh, this, this basic concept of the partition function, partition functions multiplying each other if the energies add is not um, limited to going from the molecular partition functions to the system partition function. You can also, also look at the molecular partition function itself. And if the energy, the molecular energy, can be written in terms of a sum of energies of different uh, 
uh, degrees of freedom, for instance, the energy of a molecule could be the energy of a vibration plus the energy of a translation plus the energy of the rotation plus the energy of the magnetic field plus the energy of the electric field, et cetera. You have many energies that can add up with each other to create the molecular energy. And uh, what we're going to be able to write then is that this molecular partition function itself can be written in terms of a product of partition functions for the sub parts of the molecular energy. Okay, so let me clarify that statement then. So if I can write my molecular energy epsilon is equal to a translational energy plus a vibrational energy plus a rotational energy plus every other little energies that you can think of that are independent of each other, then using the same argument we used to show that Q is the multiplication of these molecular partition function, we can uh, write that the molecular partition function little q um, is just the multiplication of the uh, degree of freedom partition functions, molecular partition functions, the translational partition function times the vibrational partition function times the rotational partition function, et cetera. If the energies add, then the partition functions multiply each other. And that's going to be powerful because when we look at something like a, a polymer or DNA or protein or something in, in solution, and we're going to be looking at the configurations possible for that, for that uh, polymer or that uh, uh, biopolymer, then we'll know that the energy of that polymer in solution is going to be, we, we'll be able to approximate it as the energy of configuration for that polymer, the different ways that you can fold the, the protein, for instance, plus everything else, the energy of everything else. Okay. So if the configurational energy can be separated from the sum of all vibration energies of all the bonds in that polymer, the way that polymer interacts with, um, uh, with the, the way that the, the, the solution itself interacts with itself, um, then if we can do this, and we can do this approximation most of the time, uh, then we'll be able to take the partition function for the polymer and write it as the configurational partition function times the partition function for everything else. And we'll find that, that, um, uh, that this part here will tend to, um, to factor out. We won't have to worry about it and that this will carry all the important information that we'll need to know to see about changes in the system, right? Changes in the Gibbs free energy, changes in the chemical potential. Everything will be related to this partition function, uh, this subsystem. And because, because of the fact that you can factor them out, uh, then this thing will end up dropping out and, and this will become the important factor. Okay, let's do, a, let's do a quick example. Okay, so this is the example of having um, a very, very short polymer containing three monomers, which can be in two configurations. Okay. So the, um, and the energies are the same for these two configurations. So the configurational partition function, which you would generally write as the sum of e to the minus ei for that configuration divided by kt plus e to the so usually you would write it as e to the minus epsilon uh, one over kt plus e to the minus epsilon two over kt, et cetera, right? They're all the same energy, uh, and there are two configurations. There's a, the degeneracy is two, so you can write this as the degeneracy of the configuration 
times the energy of the configuration. And you can uh, set your energy reference to be zero. You can choose whatever you want it to be, and zero is a good number, so that e to zero is equal to one. So the configurational partition function is just the degeneracy, which is equal to two in this case here. Um, so now let's calculate uh, uh, the um, uh, molecular and canonical partition uh, and uh, canonical partition functions for a, a, an ideal gas of these uh, molecules here. And uh, it's usually interesting to use a, a lattice model as a guide. And so in this lattice model here, you would divide space up into uh, little cells. This is in, in two dimensions, but in reality would be in three dimensions. And then you place your molecules in, in lattice sites, something like this. Right. And then you end up counting uh, the number of ways of arranging the molecules uh, on the lattice. And let's say that we have n molecules that are in the gas phase. And uh, the molecular volume, i.e. The, the size of a lattice, uh, a lattice site is V. That's the molecular volume. And N times V is the total volume. Uh, oh, well, no, N times V is not. That's the total volume occupied by the, uh, the, the particles. The total volume is the number of lattice sites. V um, is the total volume. Uh, and we're going to assume that um, the, all particles, all molecules have, this, have the same translation energy. It's, it's an adequate approximation. We're going to set that equal to zero. Okay. So all molecules at any position here has the same E translation. And we're going to set that equal to zero. Okay. So the, the uh, translational partition function, the molecular translational partition function is, um, well, there's only one energy. It's zero, right? So we only care about the degeneracy of that molecule. That molecule, the, the molecule could be in here, or it could be 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 here, or it could be, here, or it could be anywhere, right? The number of ways of putting that molecule on the lattice is the number of lattice sites available, which is basically the molecular volume, uh, is, which is the total volume divided by the molecular volume. Right. The total volume is, um, right. so the total volume is the number of lattice sites times the volume of each lattice site. Right. So the total volume divided by the small volume is the total number of lattice sites. And the number of choices of putting that one molecule is anywhere on the lattice. Okay, that's your degeneracy. So now if I look at the total molecular partition function, uh, the, it's going to be the multiplication of the configurational partition function and the translational partition function. At each site, the molecule could have two configurations. So Q for the molecule is Q translational. I'm going to ignore all vibrations, rotation, et cetera. I'm going to assume that there are two degrees of freedom, the translational one, which is basically a positional one, and then the configurational one, which is internal to the molecule. Configuration. So this one is V over V. That's the degeneracy, capital V over little v, the degeneracy of placing the molecule in, 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 on the lattice. And the configuration is the degeneracy of how the molecule folds. 
Okay. Yes. I have the, the notes are wrong. So usually capital V is large and little v is small. So in the notes, if we have it reversed, we should fix that. Um, this is lecture 25, right? Mm -hmm. So we have Q, no, the note seems to be right. Total volume is capital V, molecular volume is little v. Um, where, where is it wrong in the notes? Oh, look at that. My notes are different than yours. <laughs> <laughs> My notes are right. Okay, well, it's, it's obviously right on the web. <laughs> Because this, this is the latest version. All right, so fi flip, flip those big Vs and little Vs then. Huh, I thought they were from the same pile. Okay, so this is your um, molecular partition function. And then when you look at the, translate, uh, the system, the system partition function can also be separated into a translation and a, and a configuration for the system we know what you need to do is take all the molecular partition functions, the translational ones, and to the nth factor, the number of particles. But now you, can, you, you have degeneracy, you, you're overcounting, right? And so you need to divide this by n factorial. You also have the um, system partition function for the configurations. And that's Q configuration to the n. Except here, we don't need to divide by 1 over n factorial because we're not overcounting here. Right? The overcounting only takes into, it only happens when you're placing part identical particles in a lattice and you can swap them without making a difference. Here, we're talking about configurations. We're not, when we're talking about configurations, we're not talking about placing the identical particles in different spots. We're just looking at these two configurations here. And then the next particle is two configurations. The next particle is two configurations. Right? So this is really important that this n over factorial only comes into play when you're talking about the translational degree of freedom, not the other degrees of freedom. And now the total system partition function is the multiplication of these two. It um, ends up being capital V over V to the n power over n factorial times 2 to the n. OK. Uh, in general, you could extend this analysis to include vibrations, rotations, energy in a magnetic field, electric field, et cetera. Any questions? All right, the next thing that you're going to do then is to use this concept, this sort of example, as a way to begin to calculate things that you've already calculated before. For instance, uh, if you look at an expansion of an ideal gas, can we now calculate the entropy change, not based on thermodynamics, but based on the statistical mechanics, on the microscopic description that we've just gone through? And it turns out that that's, that's what happens that you can do that. And you get the same answer. Thank God you get the same answer. Otherwise, you'd be in big trouble. Right, so I'm just going to set up the problem because I won't have time to do it. And then you can do it next time. Keith comes back. So the problem is going to be the usual problem of having a volume V1 of a gas on one side and the vacuum expanding to volume V2 the gas and asking, what is the entropy change? Right? And then you know that from thermo, that delta S is, uh, in this case here, is N R log V2 over V1 when the temperature is constant. That's going to be our answer. It has to be our answer. But this time, instead of knowing the answer, we're going to calculate it from, from microscopics. 
So what you do is you start out with uh, your initial state. You ask what is the, you write down the molecular volume V. The total volume here is V1. Um, you assume that all molecules have the same translational energy, and you set that equal to zero. The system translational energy is equal to zero. And so the, uh, the entropy for this gas here is just the number of ways of placing the molecule in the lattice, in this model that we have of the space being separated into little little cell. And so S is K log omega, where omega is the number of ways of placing the molecules in the lattice, which is basically K log V over V, where this is the number of, uh, number of lattice sites. Okay. Um, and, and what you're going to do next time then is, is start from here, calculate what it is before, calculate what it is after, and turn the crank and get to the right answer. Then you're going to do the same thing for liquids, and that'll be it for the, this, the simple statistical mechanics.